Welcome to Russian History Retold, episode 163, Leo Tolstoy, The Later Years of Transformation. Last time, we told the story of the marriage of Leo and Sonia Tolstoy, as well as the events surrounding his writing and publishing of two of his greatest works, War and Peace and Anna Karenina. I want to go back to that last episode and say something that I kind of failed to mention. And that War and Peace and Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment were published in the same journal on alternative months. So one month you'd get War and Peace, the next month Crime and Punishment, then back and forth. I mean, just think about that. Two of the greatest pieces of literary work in Russian or world history put out at the same time, written by authors who were to never meet each other in person. That, I find, is an incredible tragedy. And also, in a strange irony between the two great authors, was that Anna Karenina, in the serialized form, was published by Katkov in the Ruske Vestnik, a reactionary journal at the time, that Tolstoy was now moving toward anarchism in the left. And Fyodor Dostoevsky, who was moving to the far right in his political views, would have his work published in The Devils, by the or his work, The Devils, by the leftist Nekrasov in the Contemporary. So it's kind of unusual. The right wing published by the left wing, and the left winger published in the right wing. I don't think that's something that we'd see in today's world. Anyways, the praise being heaped on Tolstoy by now in 1878 was immense. He was the most popular writer in all of Russia, and he was getting ready to write another great piece on the Decemberists. Those officers who tried to stage a revolt over Nicholas I's ascension to the throne in 1825. It was to be kind of a follow-up to War and Peace. But as A.N. Wilson puts it in his biography of Tolstoy, which I absolutely really believe you need to read, it, if you want to read more about him and find out where I get a lot of my information, this is a great one. Henry Troyatz is the other one, but I think this one gets more into the heart and soul of Leo Tolstoy than some of the others. Uh, the book, it was stillborn, as Wilson put it. Something was gnawing at the very soul of Leo Tolstoy. Post Anna Karenina, he fell into disfavor with Dostoevsky, who absolutely hated the prologue, or the epilogue, excuse me, that saw Levin become a pacifist regarding the Slavic uprising and the Balkans that was happening at the time. And the Slavophiles wanted to really aid the uh, people there. Uh, in his Diary of a Writer, Fyodor rips into this epilogue. He says, quote, Is it for mere vengeance, for mere killing, that Russian people have risen? And when was it that assistance to the massacred, to those who were being exterminated by entire regions, to assaulted women and children in whose defense there was no one in the whole world to intercede, was considered a callous, ridiculous, and almost immoral act, a craving for vengeance and bloodthirst. And what insensibility side by side with sentimentalism. In fact, Levin himself has a child, a boy. He loves him. When this child is bathed in a bathtub, is almost a family event. Why doesn't his heart bleed when he hears and reads about wholesale massacres, about children with crushed heads crawling around their assaulted, murdered mothers with their breasts cut off? This happened in a Bulgarian church where 200 such corpses were found, after the town had been plundered. Levin reads this and there he stands and meditates. Kitty is cheerful today. She ate with an appetite. The boy was bathed in the tub, and he begins to recognize me. What do I care about things that are transpiring in another hemisphere? No immediate settlement for the oppression of the Slavs exists or can exist, because I feel nothing. Is this how Levin brings to a close his story? Is it he whom the author seeks to set forth as an example of a truthful, honest man? Men such as the author of Anna Karina are teachers of society, our teachers, while we are merely their pupils. What then do they teach us? 
a very stinging rebuttal, but one that did not seem to have any effect on Tolstoy. It's really interesting. In all these works of Tolstoy, he points out the wrongness of things. And I'm going to bring this up a few times in this podcast. But never a solution. What were we going to do with these massacred people in Bulgaria? He doesn't want to go to war. He's a pacifist. But yet he thinks we shouldn't do it. What do we do then? Now, Tolstoy did want to clear things up with one of his other contemporary authors. He tried to make good with his old friend Ivan Turgenev by sending him a letter asking for forgiveness for past transgressions. Turgenev went to visit Tolstoy at Yasnaya Polyana and saw in Leo a different man, someone struggling with existential questions like, why are we here? Is there a God? And what is the purpose of life? His demeanor concerned Ivan, thinking that perhaps Leo was going crazy. Instead, a religious fervor began to build in Leo. He started by going to the church more often, going to confession and keeping fasts. But for some reason, the church did not satisfy his cravings for a more godly life. He began to read the Gospels and following the life of Jesus. Tolstoy began to have a conversion to a different type of Christianity, one of poverty and giving up worldly things. The conversion of literary giants in Russia is not uncommon. As Wilson points out, quote, the progress from artist to sage or holy man, which to Western readers seems embarrassing or a bit of a bore, is a fairly common phenomenon amongst Russian writers. Leskov did it. Gogol did it. In his own fashion, Dostoevsky did it. We have a more contemporary example with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. In almost all cases, the majority of westernized critics find, within such transformations, an artistic falling off. It is hard to judge in such a subjective matter. If we are predisposed in favor of holy men and wiseacres, we might be more inclined to take seriously the later work of Russian writers. Only by an early death, it seems, such as the blessed, as blessed the careers of Pushkin and Lermontov, can the great Russian writer escape the desire to become a prophet. We can look at the life and literary career of Tolstoy as being kind of split in two. One, the years before the publication of Anna Karenina, and the years after. Now, even though he would write many more short stories and really impressive works, many believed that he would never achieve any work as great as his two novels. Wilson says that, quote, the author of War and Peace and Anna Karenina was tragically written out. This part bothers me with Wilson. I, I think he's wrong in this because, as we shall see in the rest of the podcast, he wrote some incredible works. But it was a different type of work. It was a different type of writing. It was from the, deeper from the soul than I think the other two pieces, although they were from deep within his uh, heart. So in July of 1877, Tolstoy made a pilgrimage to the monastery of Optina Pustin in Kaluga with his now best friend Strakov. There he wanted to meet with a famous Staretz, the monk Amvrosi, also known as Father Ambrose. Many other famous people like Dostoevsky, Nicholas Gogol, and the philosopher Soloveyev had also made the same pilgrimage. The meeting, though, it did not go very well. He was unhappy with the answers to his questions on the gospel that the Staretz had given him. But instead of weakening his Christian beliefs, it intensified them. Leo felt that the church had baptized, bastardized the teachings of Christ with their prayers for vanquishing of their enemies while teaching to love their neighbor. He thought instead they should be praying for their enemies. How could they praise Jesus in his poverty while living in opulence with gold-adorned icons being worshipped? He really had a problem and he could no longer reconcile his beliefs with that of the Russian Orthodox Church. Tolstoy did not believe in the miracles of Christ, his resurrection or ascension into heaven. 
He also did not believe in miracles of the saints, something that's very important to the Orthodox faithful. To him, quote, to reinforce the teachings of Christ with miracles is like holding a lighted candle in front of the sun in order to see it better. In order to become more comfortable with his feelings about the church, he did something very Leo-ish, you might say. He visited numerous hermitages, visiting every monk he could see along the way with a number of metropolitans and archimandrites. Tolstoy told them how delusioned he was, but he was warned that even though he might be right, it would be ill-advised to criticize the church. The admonishments to be quiet did not his dissuade him. He writes, quote, what have they done? They've cupped up the teachings into shreds and tacked their idiotic, vile explanations, hateful to Christ, onto every morsel. They've blocked the door for others and won't go inside themselves. Tolstoy was not going to take his problems with the church laying down. He would do what he was best at, write his feelings down. Leo visited his pious aunt Alexandra, to tell her his newfound ideas. The meeting, <clears throat> it did not go well. He parted in a bad mood, as was she. Try as they might, they could never see eye to eye on the Russian Orthodox Church. Beginning in 1879, he would write four books on his beliefs, starting with Confession, then in 1880, Criticism of Dogmatic Theology, 1882, Union and Translation of the Four Gospels, and finally, in 1883, What I Believe. To try to publish these works during the reign mostly of the arch-conservative Tsar Alexander III was a brave thing. But if you printed less than 30 copies of a book, the censors wouldn't touch it. Well, they knew about Leo. The police would confiscate many of the printed books anyway. In 1881, Tsar Alexander II had been assassinated, which shook up Tolstoy. He would write a letter to the new Tsar through Strakov, who would present it to the minister Pobodonetsev, asking that the conspirators' lives should be spared. Well, <laughs> that letter was not forwarded to the Tsar. Around this time, the Tolstoy family moved to Moscow. And I'm going to talk about this again later. It was not the place that Leo believed it to be. He saw it as a horrible city. One incident that lasted three days in January of 1882 was a census of the population. Leo went with the census takers to Skid Row. He writes, quote, Terrified and frightening in their terror, they clustered together by the reeking cesspool, listened to our explanations, and did not believe a word we said. Every dwelling was full, every bunk occupied. All the women who were not dead drunk were lying with men. Many of those who had babies with them were wallowing on narrow bunks with total strangers. After this place a second identical, then a third, tenth, twentieth, and so on, forever, and everywhere the same suffocating stench, cramped quarters, mingling of the sexes, men and women drunk to the point of idiocy, and on every face the same alarm. Alarm, the same docility, the same guilt. Tolstoy would write an appeal to the wealthy to help out the poor, wretched individuals he came across in Moscow. He thought that he could start a large movement, but alas, it fell on deaf ears. Instead, he began to build a small following of supporters, people who thought like him. This caught the eye of the governor general of Moscow, Prince Dolgorukov, who sent a gendarme to ask Tolstoy about the meetings he was setting up with members of high society. He was repulsed, but kept the pressure on Leo. Frustrated, he left his family behind and headed back to Yasnaya Polyana. After a while, he returned to Moscow and was asked to give a speech in honor of his old friend Ivan Turgenev, who had passed away. By now, Tolstoy was being spied upon by the secret police who told Prince Dolgorukov about the talk. An order came down from the Tsar through another Tolstoy, Leo's cousin, who was the Minister of the Interior at the time, that all speeches must be pre-approved by the government before being given. 
This caused much consternation amongst the organizers of the tribute. Eventually, the event was canceled. It is during this time that we begin to see in earnest the degradation of the relationship between Sonia and Leo. His obsession with finding the meaning of life through the Gospels and the teachings of Christ were all consuming. In a letter to her sister, Sonia writes, quote, Lievochka works all the time, but alas, he is writing some kind of religious dissertation to prove that the church disagrees with the teaching of the Gospels. There will be barely ten people in Russia who interest themselves in it. She was very wrong in her assessment of the Russian people's interest in Leo's work. Something still was gnawing at his insides, his very soul. It just could not be resolved by writing another novel. No, it had to come from deep inside, which is where we get his next work, a confession. In it, he lays out his life from the pleasure-seeking young man, the warrior, then the literary artist yearning for fame and money, the obsessed family man who then becomes haunted by a sense of hopelessness, of not knowing the meaning of life and answering the questions, who am I? What is the point of living? He then details his break from the Russian Orthodox Church and its doctrines. This work is considered his finest non-fiction work. As one critic put it, quote, one of the noblest and most courageous utterances of man. There were debates that raged to this day about the honesty of the work, though, as some claim that he kind of degrades himself a little bit too much. But one thing is clear. He did bear himself for all the world to see. Also, in writing a confession, we see why he decided to become a fervent pacifist. Someone people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. would look up to in the future. He reminds the reader that Christ specifically told his followers not to seek revenge against those who harmed him. The lesson of turning the other cheek. Tolstoy points out that the Christian church abandoned that glaring pacifist point of view with their prayers to those who would vanquish their enemies. Well, the point of total pacifism has kind of some major glaring holes in it. Well, think of this. How about not fighting the Nazis in World War II? I mean, we have other historical events, though, promoted by the many Christian churches like the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, and the prayers given by the priests at the Siege of Kazan when driving the Terrible. Tolstoy points this out much to the dismay of the Orthodox Church, as well as the government of Russia at the time. In his later work, What I Believe, he further goes on to explain his need to jettison the Orthodox Church from his life. It is here we begin to see the anarchist in Leo. He believes that Jesus was very much against rulers, whether secular or religious. His beliefs were a pacifist anarchist. Now, this group is a very small minority of people throughout history, to say the least. Now, at this time in Russian history, two events were to occur while Tolstoy was writing these things. And the first was on February 9th, 1881, when Fyodor Dostoevsky died. The second and more profound event was the assassination of the liberator czar Alexander II on March 13th, 1881. He was really, truly appalled by the assassins. But he also believed they should be pardoned and not punished. His pacifism carried him to his convictions and his belief in Christ's idea of turning the other cheek. With the death of the Tsar, a new man was to come to power. Alexander III, whose chief advisor, was to be the arch-reactionary Konstantin Pobodonetsov. In a letter to the Tsar regarding the assassins, Leo writes, quote, Sire, if you were to summon these people, to give them money and to send them away somewhere to America, and were to write a manifesto headed by the words, But I say unto you, love your enemies. I don't know about the others, but I, a poor loyal subject, would be your dog and slave. I would weep with emotion as I am weeping now every time I heard your name. 
But what am I saying? I don't know about the others. I know that at these words, goodness and love would flow across Russia in a torrent. The truths of Christ are alive in the hearts of man, and they are only alive. And when we love others only in the name of these truths, of course, this letter was never delivered to the Tsar, but would mark him as a troublemaker by Pope Donetsov. Family life was becoming more and more of a struggle as Sonia's bad temper and her lack of caring for Leo was dividing the family who took one side or the other. As I said before, they decided to move to Moscow in part to provide a better education for the children and in part for Sonia to be nearer to her family, the Bears. Leo, on the other hand, would have liked it better if they moved to faraway remote regions of Russia to be nearer to the people, the peasant, the mushik. By the fall of 1883, what I believe was finished, a few months after the death of Ivan Turgenev. What the book attempts to do is not decide whether evolution or Adam and Eve are true, or whether Noah's Ark was real, but answering the question, is the moral teaching of Jesus true? It was then that Leo was to meet a man who was to be a devoted follower for the rest of his life, Vladimir Grigorievich Cherk. Chertkov was enamored of Leo, but not in a sexual way, but intellectually. Their friendship became very deep, which angered the jealous Sonia. In 1884, she was to give birth to their 13th child, the one who would further her father's legacy more than anyone else, Alexandra Livovna. She was to found the Tolstoy Foundation in the United States, which is headquartered in Rockland County, New York, in the town of Valley Cottage. I had the pleasure of meeting her when I was a child, not knowing that one day I would tell the story of her father, something she felt was very important in her lifetime. I am glad that I could do something for his legacy and her honor as the Tolstoy Foundation was an important humanitarian organization helping Russians and then Soviet citizens to lead a better life outside of their native country. Now back to Leo, Sonia, and Chertkov. Sonia saw that the family's finances were dwindling since Leo stopped writing popular material. She decided to compile some of his previous writing and published the book The Collected Works of L. N. Tolstoy. Chertkov printed three of his books, a captive, or Leo's books, A Captive in the Caucasus, What Men Live By, and God Sees the Truth But Waits. In 1884, the authorities began to censure Leo's newer works. On February 18th, the police seized as many copies of what I believe as they could find. But they were way too late. Enough copies had gotten out that the cat was out of the bag, so to say. This was a time in Russia that the pogroms against the Jews were heating up, causing more than a million of them to leave the country. Christian dissident groups like the Molokans, Dukhobors, and the Old Believers were being persecuted mercilessly. In this atmosphere, Leo was to write, What they must, what must we do now? Here's a passage I found from the book that's really profound. Quote, the hatred and contempt of the oppressed masses are increasing, and the physical and moral forces of the wealthy classes are weakening. The deception on which everything depends is wearing out, and the wealthy classes have nothing to console themselves within this mortal danger. To return to the old ways is not possible. Only one thing is left for those who do not wish to change their way of life, and that is to hope that, Things will last my time. After that, let happen what may. This is what the crowd of the rich are doing. But the danger is ever growing, and the terrible catastrophe draws near. This was written in 1886. 31 years later, his prediction would come to be during the Russian Revolution. Quickly after this, he writes the famous novella, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. Although his relationship with his wife Sonia by now had degraded to a big degree, this work was done for her as a new addition to his collected edition she was putting out. If any of you have read it, and I 
remember telling my Rotary Club, you know, I'm doing this podcast on Russian history, and now I'm doing a series on Leo Tolstoy, and one of the guys who's the upcoming president of the club said, hey, I remember reading that one. I read something on Tolstoy. Yeah, it was the uh, death of Ivan Ilyich. That was really fascinating. Now, if any of you have read it, you know how depressing it is, but at the same time, very appealing. It follows the slow death of the lead character of Cancer and how he sees that his life has been a gigantic waste of time. He's a, a lawyer, a judge. Uh, Ivan Ilyich is in many ways Leo Tolstoy, with the quarrelsome wife and the reflection of life is somehow meaningless. It was the same internal struggle that Leo was facing, looking back at his own life. His next work was to come while he was extremely ill in 1886 from a leg infection. It would be his first play, The Power of Darkness. It was a brutal depiction of peasants. Tsar Alexander III loved it, but his chief minister, Pobodonetsov, hated it and thought it would be a work of sedition. They began to censor the book, but over one million copies had already been printed by Chertkov. Revolutionaries around Russia gobbled up the book. And six of them, in a strange twist of fate, six students were arrested for treason who had purchased this book at the same time the censorship had begun. One of them, a young man named Alexander Ulyanov, was hanged. His brother Vladimir revowed revenge of the Romanovs. We know this man as Lenin. Tolstoy's next literary work is the controversial The Kreutzer Sonata. It was a puritanical work that claimed that sexual intercourse was an evil thing that should only happen between a husband and wife and only to produce children. Any other reason debases humankind. Again, we see much of Leo in the book. It looks like he's trying to confess the sins of his past. It is also a very different point of view from his book, What Then Must We Do? where he thought that procreation was a good thing. And, and we do see this hypocrisy in Leo time and time again. One day he's got one point of view, next day it's different. And boy, that next day he's solid in his belief that that's the right way. What he did before was a mistake. And one of the reasons for this change was literature he had received from the United States from a religious group known as the Shakers. Alice B. Stockham's Tocology, A Book for Every Woman, was a big influence on Leo. It claims that the original sin of Adam and Eve was not that apple, but it was sexual intercourse. Celibacy was pure, although even Tolstoy admitted to Chertkov, I'm a dirty, libidinous old man. At the age of 63 in 1891, Leo produced the works Father Sergius and Resurrection, in which he espouses vegetarianism and continued sexual abstinence. This is also the time, a uh, very small slice of time, that he and Sonia actually got along quite well. Russia, though, was about to go into one of its greatest tragic periods of famine. The government of Russia was as corrupt as it has ever been. Everyone was seemingly on the take, only looking to find a way to make an extra dollar. News of the famine was cons constantly being suppressed by local officials, so they thought, oh, if I tell anybody anything, it might cause me to lose my money from St. Petersburg. That and Popodonetsov's reactionary policies had halted Russia's improvement of its infrastructure, which caused further delays in getting aid out to the countryside. Tolstoy's friend of many years, Ivan Ivanovich Rayevsky, pleaded with Leo to come out and see how bad things were around Yasnaya Polyana, but Leo refused. He felt that people should be self-sufficient, and that the rich helping the poor was a, just a waste of time and money. The poor would only use the money for lecherous things and not to improve their lot. Rayevsky, though, convinced Leo to let his three sons, Sergei, Ilya, and Lev, to go with him to take a census of the crops in the neighboring district. They came back in July 1891 and reported the horrors they witnessed. There was no real food, and what was available to eat were weeds like goosefoot. It caused diarrhea and cholera, further weakening the peasants, especially children and the elderly. The Tolstoy family, though, went into action. They set up soup kitchens wherever they could. Leo, of course, would use his most powerful tool, writing. He wrote letters to newspapers, and in one particular, Ruskia 
Vedomosti, a liberal paper, published his article, A Terrible Question. In it, he asks and wonders whether Russia could indeed feed itself. Sonia took to the pen as well as blasting his opponents, as Wilson says in his biography of Leo, by, quote, attacking the appalling contrasts between rich and poor which existed in society. And if you think the 1% in the United States has gotten away with things, it was far worse in Russia. It was a tenth of a percent to the population. After this exchange, the government banned any letter being written by the Tolstoys to be published. Rayevsky died suddenly of the flu due to his weakened state caused by his nonstop work for the poor. By July 1892, Leo had personally raised 140,000 rubles, a not too tidy sum at the time, including half a million dollars from followers in the United States and 26,000 pounds from the British Quakers. With it, he was feeding 13,000 people daily at 246 soup kitchens. His family also set up another 124 special children's kitchens to feed an additional 3,000 people. Tsar Alexander III, in his idiocy, began to believe that Leo and Sonia were part of a British plot to overthrow the government and sent religious leaders to investigate the Tolstoys and then to tell the public he was an antichrist. The priest told the peasants, quote, You think that Antichrist will come in an evil guise? No, he will come to you with kindness, with bread at the very time you will be dying of hunger. But woe to him who is seduced by this bread. Needless to say, the peasants would have none of this nonsense. There was even talk in the upper echelons of the government to banish the Tolstoys to England. Alexander III decided otherwise, writing, no action yet on the order. Around 400,000 people died in the famine in Russia during the years 1891 and 92. Another interesting thing in uh, history, Lenin was in Samara, where much of Leo's work was being done. Lenin refused to help, believing that the famine was a good thing to break down the peasants and hasten the revolution. That point of view may help to explain a little bit of the famine of 1921, where somewhere between one to three million people died. And when Stalin was leader in 1932 to 33, in that famine where five million people died. Tolstoy was now in the crosshairs of the Tsar and his committee of ministers. The Tsar felt that he was anointed by God through Jesus to be the head of the Russian state, and Leo believed that no one can make a claim like that and simultaneously do what was forbidden by Christ. A rumor that Leo's cousin Alexandrine, uh, who lived in St. Petersburg, heard, made her ask for an audience with the Tsar. She told him, In a few days, a report will be made to you about shutting up in a monastery the greatest genius in Russia. Tolstoy was his response. Alexine, Alexandrine replied, You guessed it, sire. The Tsar asked, does this mean that he's plotting against my life? Wilson points out that the incredible absurdity of this question. Tolstoy taking out the Tsar? Really? A pacifist? Come on. But cooler heads prevailed, and they realized if they were to take out Tolstoy in that manner, he would be made a martyr, and that he would present a far, far greater threat to their power. But then, an even more powerful work that would shake up Russian society, especially at the top, would be published. The Kingdom of God is Within You. Tolstoy here blasts the hypocrisies within the Orthodox Church. He also believes that if men and women would follow their consciences, that hatred of the world would cease. Leo felt that people were good in their course. He firmly believes that if we continue to evolve our consciences, the world would stop torture, floggings, and wars. And in some ways, he's right. Humankind is a better place now than it was in any time in human history. I mean, you may not see it because of the global news and the internet, ISIS, and all things like that, 
But it really is a better and more peaceful time globally than it has been in the past. But we also see the hypocrisy in his work, as he believed that Russia was in the spring of this magical transformation. We know that this was anything but the truth with the coming of the Bolshevik Revolution and the horrible pain, suffering, and millions and millions of deaths caused by communist rule. The book claims that abolishing armies, police, and governments would lead to some magical utopian world. It gives us no answers to what to do with the evil people doing evil things. And at the time that he wrote this, a young man in South Africa began to read his work, especially the kingdom of God. That man was Mahatma Gandhi. His passive resistant movement was inspired, in his own words, by Leo Tolstoy. Now, there's some disagreement as to whether this passive resistance and the split of Pakistan and India caused, which did cause millions of deaths in the Civil War, and to this day there's a lot of animosity whether this was a good thing or bad. But Gandhi was a person who believed in passive resistance to get a cause done, as was Martin Luther King in the United States. So whether you agree with what happened or whether history looks at it, positively there was a there was this impetus caused by leo tolstoy and he did have an enormous effect on human history now in 1894 alexander the third died his son nicholas ii who as we all know was terribly ill-equipped to be czar but czar he became many thought that the new ruler would be kinder and gentler than his father but this of course was not to be the case in Leo Tolstoy's case, the new czar was to be a greater enemy. By decree, Tolstoyanism, as it was called, was an indictable offense. Leo, for his part, was beginning to give away the copyrights to his works, much to the dismay of his wife, Sonia. It was the lifeblood of the household's ability to pay the bills, and he was giving it all away. This so angered her that she began to draw battle lines between her supporters within the family and his. If they sided with him, she viewed them as an enemy or a spy. The relationship was in a death spiral. At the time, some of the Tolstoy children were very ill, and one of whom, seven-year-old Vanya, would die of scarlet fever. Leo then became even more spiritual in his grief and began to follow the pacifist religious group, the Duke Habors. They staunchly refused to serve in the military, which was required by law. The government ordered Cossack troops to force them, and one general, Surovzev, told his troops that they could beat and violate any Duke Habor they came across. This stunned Leo and made him follow them even more intensely. A letter to the Times of London was smuggled out by Chertkov from Tolstoy entitled The Persecution of Christians in Russia. Because of it, Chertkov had to leave Russia and head to England because he feared for his life with his family. He was not to return to Leo's side for eight years. Persecution of religious groups not strictly following the Orthodox Church continued in earnest despite all the help that Tolstoy could muster. Leo was to help raise a substantial amount of money to help the Duke of Boers to leave Russia and eventually settle in Canada. Yeah, when they get into Canada, though, there were some little problems with this naked stuff in the orgies and the arson that they committed, but that's a different story. The next literary work that Tolstoy would write is Resurrection. Now, many think that it's not his best piece, but one that critics claim needs to be read numerous times to understand its incredible depth. It was at this time that Pobodonetsov had enough of Tolstoy. He couldn't attack him from the government side, but he could from the religious end. He was the procurator of the Holy Synod, and he had power over the church. Through his machinations, on February 24th, 1901, Metropolitan Anthony of St. Petersburg read the following edict. Quote, well known to the world as a writer, Russian by birth, 
Orthodox by Baptism and Education. Count Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy, seduced by intellectual pride, has arrogantly risen against the Lord and his Christ and his holy heritage, and has plainly, in the sight of all, repudiated his Orthodox Mother Church, which reared and educated him and has dedicated his literary activity and the talent given to him by God to disseminating among the people teachings opposed to church and Christ, and to destroying in the minds and hearts of people their national faith, that orthodox faith which has been confirmed by the universe, in which our forefathers lived and saved, and to which holy Russia until now is clung, and in which it has been strong. It went on for a while until the line was read that, quote, the church does not recognize him as a member. Leo Tolstoy had been excommunicated from the Russian Orthodox Church. His dismissal from the church was a national sensation. Some called him the devil. Others called him a saint. To Leo, edict was no surprise as he had been lambasting the church for some 20 years already. Instead of silencing Tolstoy, Pobodonetsov had made him and his book Resurrection even more popular. Tolstoy's health by now was deteriorating as he had contracted malaria in June of 1901. A friend had him stay at Honor Estate in Gaspra, on the southern shore of the Crimean Sea, to regain his strength. While he was there, he was to prevent to, to befriend two newer giants in Russian literature, people I'm going to do podcasts on eventually. Anton Chekhov and Maxim Gorky. Chekhov, who was also a doctor, thought that Tolstoy had little time left on earth when they parted in 1902, but it was Anton who was to die early, passing away just two years later. Leo, he had eight more years. The next literary work that Tolstoy would write was entitled The Restoration of Hell. Set 300 years after the death of Jesus, the devil is lamenting the emptiness of his domain after Christ had let out all the souls. No one was coming in until another minor devil comes down and tells him that things were about to look up as the Christians had developed something known as the church. Leo once again thumbed his nose at the institution, not the religion. On March 4, 1904, Tolstoy's beloved cousin, Alexandrine, died. But this was not to end the sadness, as on August 22nd, his last brother, Sergei, passed away of cancer. These tragedies set the stage for another of Leo's great works toward the end of his life, with the publication of After the Ball. Many view this as being on par with War and Peace and Anna Karenina, so another book I had never heard of that I'm definitely going to read. In this era, Europe was enmeshed in a period of fervent nationalism, which was to eventually cause World War I. Each country believed itself to be the greatest nation in the world, and Russia was no stranger to this phenomenon, which... I found out many historians have tried to analyze, and there's been a lot of debate about it, but they've no real explanation about this behavior. And because of this, you know, we have the beginning of the Russo-Japanese War, which, of course, as you know, was to prove disastrous to Russia. At first, Leo felt a surge of nationalism, but he tempered it with his belief in pacifism. Russia was now in a dangerous position especially after Bloody Sunday in 1905. Strikes began to occur all over the country. Turmoil was everywhere. In this climate, Tolstoy was to complete another of his incredible works, Haji Murat, as well as, and this is another piece of work I had never heard of, Shakespeare and the drama. By this time, Leo was so popular that the government knew that visitors to Russia would want to see three things. Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Yasnaya Polyana. There was a rail line between the two cities and an incredibly well-paved road to Tolstoy's home. 
In late 1906, Sonia became very ill and almost died as she was suffering from a large uterine tumor. They successfully removed it and she recovered, but tragedy struck the Tolstoy family when Masha, their daughter, passed away suddenly at the young age of 36. He was with her in, his, in her last moments, holding her hand, unlike with his brothers Nikolai and Dmitri. Now 78, Tolstoy felt that his life was nearing its inevitable end. It is now 1907, and there were a string of robberies and murders around the area of Yasnaya Polyana. Guards were assigned to the estate, which greatly disturbed the pacifist Leo. Still, Sonia insisted. His next pamphlet was entitled, I Cannot Be Silent, which condemned the increased use of the death penalty throughout Russia. Leo also received a letter from Gandhi telling him about the conditions of Indian laborers in Transvaal, South Africa. Tolstoy responded by encouraging the use of civil disobedience and passive resistance. Chertkov was now allowed to come back to Russia, and he was back at Leo's side, which greatly pleased the author. Living three miles away in a large manor house, Chertkov was building a world headquarters for a Tolstoyan following. Sonia now owned all the rights to everything that Leo had gathered in his lifetime that he had not given away except the copyrights to his literary works. Chertkov now owned it, which made Leo's wife frantic and hysterical. She was showing signs of paranoia, especially when she found out about secret letters between the two men. A tenth will was written up in 1909, as the previous nine had serious issues with it. In it, Tolstoy leaves all his possessions, including his copyrights, to his daughter, Sasha, and if she were to die, to his other daughter, Tanya. The next battle was over Leo's diaries. Sonia felt that she should have complete control, especially since the disastrous reading of his sexual escapades when they were first married. Chertkov thought that he, the disciple of Tolstoy, should be the one to take control. Sonia, in her paranoia, had copied every word of Leo's diary and kept it to herself. She also wrote down things in her own diary to make sure that her version of things would be protected as well. Not only did the two Tolstoys write down everything they saw and did, just about everyone in their entourage did as well. Some, like Valentin Bulkakov, noted how tense the situation was between husband and wife. He saw the times of pure hatred between them. She, though, was by now completely crazy. In the last year of his life, Tolstoy noted how he had lost his three brothers, his aunt Toinette, and six of his 14 children. He still, though, had his sister Maria, who was now a nun in a convent. Sonia, for her part, was completely unhinged, as one episode shows. She was in a rage at Chertkov and went searching for a pistol to shoot a picture of him. She found one and began firing it, not realizing it was, it was a toy gun. Tolstoy, fearing the end of his life was near, escaped Yasnaya Polyana, thinking he can get away from Sonia and die in peace. He headed toward a train station as Kozyolovsk, and then off to a local monastery where he stayed for the night. The hatred that surrounded him by her was just too much to bear. He wrote her a letter saying goodbye and asking that she not follow him. Strangely, that morning, Sonia, who woke up really early in the morning normally, didn't wake up until 11 a.m., making many believe that the family doll, the doctor, Makovsky, had somehow given her uh, something to uh, make her sleep a little better and let Leo get far away. You know, it's really hard to imagine that a marriage that produced 14 children and some of the greatest literary works in the world could have become so bad that one person would want to get away from it and die away from the person they were married to for over 48 years. But this was the case with Leo and Sonia. After seeing his sister, Maria, he headed to the local train station near the monastery at 4 a.m. in the morning. And this is winter. You know, winter in Russia, wherever you guys see, it's kind of like Boston in 
2014-15, but yeah, a little colder. Uh, he was walking to the station by himself. Now, he boarded a train when his children, Sasha and Varya, and Dr. Makovsky appeared. He was now ill, very ill, and they asked that the train stop at the next station. Now one of the most famous in the literary world, Astapovo, which would later be renamed Leo Tolstoy, the town, the whole town was named Leo Tolstoy, in 1932 by order of Stalin. The train station master gave the entourage access to this, his home and just to make the author just more comfortable. By now, news was traveling around the world that Tolstoy was dying. Shirtkov was summoned by his master. Sonia, despite being begged by her children not to go, went. She was not allowed in the room initially. Crowds gathered as Leo began to develop pneumonia and started to slip away. On November 2, 1910, he wrote the last entry in his diary, the last words out of his pen. Quote, it was a hard night. The Mujiks, you know, they know how to die. A cameraman named Meyer was at the station and he filmed the scene, which included everything except the deathbed. The film exists to this day, and you can look it up online. Sonia was finally allowed into the room, but not allowed to stay. On never, November 4th, Metropolitan Anthony of St. Petersburg sent a telegram urging Leo to repent, but he refused. On November 7th, 1910, Leo Tolstoy took his last breath with his wife, Sonia, at his side. His funeral procession was followed by thousands. All over Russia, protests and gatherings sprouted up in his name. The Orthodox Church, though, refused to allow for a full funeral, a full religious funeral. This was the first public funeral since the time of Vladimir the Great and the conversion of the people of Russia, almost 1,000 years before, that was not attended by the rites of the church. The large crowd, numbering around three to 4,000, began singing old Russian Orthodox funeral songs, with men and women bowing to the casket as it passed, some going down to their knees in reverence. Thankfully, we have his diaries, and more importantly, his literary works to remember him forever. When I wrote this, there were some tears in my eyes as I thought about this man and what he meant to the world and his incredible legacy and the words that he gave to us, this, the themes, the beauty of his works. And I highly recommend to you Pick up a couple of his, his works, his books. Get them on Kindle. Get them, you know, on Amazon. Read them. And understand the beauty of what this man gave to this world. And, and you'll be as stupefied as I am. You know, now we know more about him. I know more than I ever would have. I had read War and Peace before. I read Anna Karenina. And I found more works of his, and I'm just astounded by the beauty of the word. He is, in my opinion, the greatest writer in human history. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. <laughs> it's a rather lengthy one, the longest one, I believe, in this podcast's history. But today, we say goodbye to Leo Tolstoy. But next time, I hope to bring you the story of the life of another literary giant in Russian history, Alexander Pushkin. So now, as always, Das Vidanya Espasiba Bolshoya.